Thank you, George. Thank you. Maybe I'll mimic the mayor and try to talk more informally, though I'm told I can't leave the stage because they're trying to document this for whatever reason I can't imagine. But also now I know the secret to giving a successful applause laden talk. I'm just going to strategically name countries and states and communities and continue that process. That will be the speech. But no, I, I am very honored to be with you. Uh, these sustainable community builders from around the world and, and our country and Canada. Um, I am honored to be with my colleague Lupe Ramos Montigny. We have a state board meeting tomorrow where we'll try to uh, do better to shape education policy so more young people can learn in this state. But I was really, I was very flattered and honored to be asked by Mayor Hartwell to come and, and give a keynote. Um, as you know, it, as you've learned about Grand Rapids from those of you that aren't here, uh, all the time, you know, this community has, with the help of many in the room, done an amazing job about organizing itself to be a model and to make a more vibrant community and to make a healthier community by animating a whole host of sustainable practices, policies. And I had the mayor come to speak to kick off this course that I started teaching because I want to drive this agenda, which I'll talk about in a minute, of the sustainable blue-green economy of the future in Michigan and the Great Lakes and the world because um, young people, young people want to be in this work and they want to see this and they want to participate in it and kids from, we have a challenge in Michigan, we educate a lot of people at our great universities and colleges but a lot of them leave us because they want to be involved in solving big problems and saving the world and sometimes they don't think they can do it from here, the polluting car capital of the world that may be backward looking, you know, the economy of the past, not the future. But uh, this course, the mayor came and kicked off and we took a vote before we started the class. How many of you, many from Michigan, many from around the country, how many of you are going to stay in Michigan to do your thing? They're interested in sustainable food, water, energy, mobility systems. and kids in the class, you know, half of them are already gone from Michigan because they don't think they could do that work here. But then if the mayor talked to them, they're all coming to Grand Rapids. I think some of them may have showed up to go to work here because they saw the possibility. They saw the activity. They saw what was going on. So, um, and the mayor didn't do it alone, but Mayor Hartwell, longest serving mayor in Grand Rapids recent history ever, has really helped this community uh, move a sustainability agenda. And the kids were most impressed that he started as a clergyman as someone who cared about the homeless and those who were needing the most lift in this community and how do they participate and have a community that works for them and young people and all people are interested in how do we do that, how do we make an economy that works for everybody and that thrives for everybody and the fact that the mayor started his career from that vantage point and now has succeeded in helping this community be a robust, dynamic, active, I mean they're like Zumba dancers down the street uh, and art prize and things you've seen that are more closely linked to the topic of tonight. So it's an impressive achievement and I'm honored again to be here with you. I'm going to talk about what I view as the coming work of the future around the world, the blue-green economy, sustainable economy of the future and how we understand it and how you all are ready, many others need to get involved with it, with a focus on water and what's water's role and how does water matter to the economy. But I want to step back and I already you saw this picture. Some of us are old enough to remember when we first saw these pictures. Uh, and it was something of an eye-opener. I think it, it at least communicated to me and others, and I was a kid, I think, in the 60s. But when we first saw these, one, it was just, boy, this is a fragile place. Look at this. It's a, this world is, this is all we've got. We better take care of it. I mean, this is our home. We better make it work as one home, or we're going to be in serious trouble. I think another Im thing this image did is what a beautiful place, what a beautiful sphere, what a beautiful home. And it's all blue and it's all green and some beautiful white clouds and the blue and the green natural reality of this place. And you know, this p imagery, some credit with helping stir the first environmental movement. We've got to take care of this planet. We, we only have one planet. We've got to manage our life and our work to. Do it sustainably. They, we didn't use that jargon back then, but that was the notion. And so, as I look at, and you're in a region, I mean, you're in a, the Great Lakes region. Again, what a beautiful place with outdoors and water and green space, but you're in a place that really was the cradle of the 
industrial, agro-industrial economy that changed the world 100 years ago. I mean, all the great industries grew up in this region from chemicals to oil to aviation to steel to the world-changing industries that this town, furniture and making auto parts, and the assembly line at Henry Ford you know, changed the way we make things and built the factory economy. And this beautiful natural place created great wealth and great industries that were, were the, the economy, the next economy of its time 100 years ago. I mean, Cleveland and Detroit were the Silicon Valley of 100 years ago. And communities like Grand Rapids grew with these great industries. And we made a lot of mess to that beautiful picture you see. But the work of tomorrow, the world needs solutions. The blue-green economy of the future is how do we solve problems in food, water, energy, transportation? How do we build those systems and deploy them that make those work for people? And how do we create a beautiful water, food, green space available to all so that all can enjoy it? So this green-blue economy of the future, how do we build the economy that solves the problems and delivers sustainable water, food, energy, and transportation systems for the world and us, and it makes a beautiful blue-green playground where you can enjoy it and have those attributes for all. And people can have access to food, and they have access to nature, they can have access to clean water. That's the work of tomorrow. That's the economy of tomorrow. And these changes are changing already and need to change everything we do, the energy we use, where we and how we live and how it's organized, the infrastructure we build, the kind of products we buy, how we feed a hungry world, an urbanizing world, how do we grow food and feed this global, I mean, we passed the tipping point a couple of years ago where more people live in global city regions than in the hinterlands. And it's continuing. How do we feed them? And it's certainly impacting where we get our water and how we treat and use our water. There are huge tr multi-trillion dollar markets for solutions and new products and services in water, in energy, in transportation, in food systems for the world. I mean, it's a huge market. We can, this can be a big part of our economy to export the businesses, the solutions, the technologies, and help the world solve these problems and do it from here and everywhere. And so there's huge business, there's huge markets, there's huge job creation. I'm focused on how do we create jobs in an economy that's based on these more sustainable work and sustainable placemaking of the future. But already we're seeing and people, the new mobility market, the clean energy market, the clean water solutions market. I mean, as California is now out of water, we need to solve all those problems. I'm going to, I'm going to start doing a Barry White on you here with the green blue economy. So there's huge markets. And in doing so, in solving these problems, we're going to make life better for a lot of people and make lives better for a lot of people. Now, this is, there's a, a, a product and technology I'm particularly fond of because it grew out here of Grand Rapids. Cascade Engineering engineered this. And I'll keep coming back to this as a great sort of example. Cascade Engineering made auto parts. You look under your hood of your car, where do you see a bunch of plastic parts? That was for years and years what they did. A big company based here in Grand Rapids, thousands of employees. Their CEO said this market is ultimately going to be diminished, the auto industry. Took them into making green products, dispo renewable products, solar panel holders, and this simple plastic filtering device to make drinkable water for the developing world that you can use local ingredients. And Christine Keller, his daughter, who waxes even more hyperbolic than I do about the virtues of this kind of technology is, look, 60% of the people in the developing world are in hospital, I guess before Ebola, because of waterborne pathogens. And here we're making something that can help solve that problem built on the competencies that made us great, our great auto industry, which is signature to us. So converting that to solve the problems of the world, and on top of that, young people, Grand Valley State University and elsewhere, they want to go and intern and work at this place instead of leave Michigan because they want to be involved in solving the big problems of the world. And if they can do it from Michigan, great. So this is a huge opportunity to do two things, make innovative products and make life better. And there's just lots of these green and blue solutions that are needed and are happening from you know, renewable energy to, you know, Detroit almost was bankrupt, seeing their future in the vault as a savior, you know, 
if we had policies that supported those kinds of technologies better, you have this again, this biosand filter, I'll keep coming back to because I just love that example of sort of how this can work so powerfully. Algal bioreactors that clean wastewater and produce methane to make energy that can save money, clean water at the same time. Great innovations. And more to come. This is one that folks at U of M are working on. 70% of Africa is off the grid. What if you can make a flexible photovoltaic sheet that can disinfect water, that can charge a cell phone? I mean, these are the kinds of solutions that the world needs and that we all need to advance. And there's lots of opportunity, lots of upside for the economy, for people, for the planet. And if we deploy these solutions, not only do we create jobs and new technologies, but we make communities that have the attributes that people want to live and work and play in. Uh, when you put in the green infrastructure, when you put parks and open space, when you have good transportation options, we were just talking about Detroit where we still don't have regional transportation bus rail that makes it possible for people to get to jobs, affordable, and as you know, young people want to live in communities that have those attributes. They don't want to drive cars. They want these things. And you have bike lanes and you have attributes like local food and healthy food available for local residents and initiatives like Double Up Bucks, which subsidizes poor people who have food stamps to be able to buy double the amount of food at the farmer's market. It win for the farmer, win for the poor people who need quality, healthy food. But as importantly, that sends a values message about what kind of community you're in. You're a community that's about solving these problems and showing the way for others. You're animating values of social justice, of sustainability, of healthy uh, living, of save, solving the world's problems and saving the planet through diminished energy use. I mean, this, you're sending a values message. This is what kind of people want to participate in and help build these communities. So you're, that's, it, that matters economically too because people want to be in those places. They will choose those places to participate in that kind of work if you're involved in it really. And certainly water is at the center. Again, this beautiful, we say we have a fifth of the nation's surface fresh water. So what? But it's true. It's amazing. Water is the center of this green, blue, economic, sustainable revolution. It's just a beautiful physical reality. You know, without water, I mean, this is the Aral Sea, you know what happened there. Growing cotton at scale, you used up all the water, and pretty soon, whew, a sea disappears. So it can be wrecked. We also know water, water, we intuitively know how special and important water is to life. It's a magical. I mean, at first, Tom Barrett, the mayor of Milwaukee, where they've organized around water as their brand, water technology business, water research, just a water place. This is not Milwaukee, by the way. That's some place on the West Coast, I think. But water is magical. But he was the first one who articulated to me at a big event at Brookings on the Great Lakes economy, water is magical. People want to be near it. They want to walk along it. They want to see it. They'll pay more to have an office or a room with a view. It's magical. We know that about water. But how does water matter to the economy? What is this blue economy? And what does this coming blue economy look like? And that's the work we're doing to try to define and put economic impact and value behind the different ways water matters. And certainly, again, intuitively, OK, people like the coasts. People want to live on the coasts. So the West Coast, East Coast, Gulf Coast, other coasts. We remind ourselves here, again, a little bit of this which is parochial. You're in Michigan, the Great Lakes, that we have a freshwater coast. 3,000 miles of it is in Michigan. That's spectacular and beautiful. And 10,000 miles of Great Lakes and St. Lawrence coast, that's equal to that distance to Perth, Australia. So we have our own freshwater coast, which is pretty amazing. Um, and some of them I like to joke that you know, the other coasts in America have their problems. You know, the West Coast, they've got, they've got fires and earthquakes that are going to knock them off. The Gulf Coast has hurricanes. And now the East Coast, too, has hurricanes. But the Gulf Coast has hurricanes, not sustainable. Um, we have no big hurricanes. We have nice, friendly things in the water. They don't bite you like sharks. And <laughs> the East Coast has not very nice people, and we have really nice people in the Great Lakes. <laughs> so we have like the best coast of all. This is perfect. So we have to leverage our coast. 
And we also know that you know, water just, it does make for kind of magical places to live, work, and visit. These are from around the region here, including Canada. So we know that these somehow matter. Oh, and in Michigan, you know, this is us. Michigan, particularly, as the Great Lakes state, surrounded by water, lots of river streams, and we have 11,000 inland lakes. Like, that's more than Minnesota, the land of lakes. Michigan has 11,000 inland lakes, and you can't go more than six miles in Michigan without bumping into a significant body of water. And this, this pure Michigan, some of you may have seen our ads, you know, peddling pure Michigan, come visit. It, it's, it speaks to us because it's kind of, it's emotionally true. It's what we associate with the lifestyle. Living, playing with our families, going to the cottage, going to the lake. You'll go to Lake Michigan tomorrow if you haven't seen it already. It's like, whoa, this is incredible. This is spectacular. And my colleague, Alan Steinman, the director of the Grand Valley State University Water Annis, Annis Water Re Resources Institute, who we worked on this blue economy, he snuck in a picture here of himself with a giant fish. That's him in the middle. Because uh, you know, this is part of this pure Michigan lifestyle. So for us, this is a big part of our identity. When you poll in Michigan and around the region, what do people care most about? It's our Great Lakes and our water. Uh, our universities come in second. You know, we're very proud of these institutions. So this is special to us. But again, not if it's on fire or is noxious or you can't be near it to enjoy it. I mean, there were four rivers that caught fire at that moment we realized maybe we better turn the clock and clean up this mess we made in this industrial heartland. The famous Cuyahoga River, but also the Buffalo River. I was just in Buffalo, which is moving their own rust to blue agenda as their future. The Chicago River and the Rouge River, which empties into the Detroit River down near the heavy industry. So four rivers caught on fire here all about the same time. Uh, so all of this sort of natural water asset is, you, you can't benefit from it if if it's on fire, certainly, and you can't be near it. And we have more um, toxic areas in the Great Lakes and brownfields, 60% of the nation's brownfields are in the Great Lakes region. So we did a lot of damage. But okay, beyond that, those are, those are some illustrations, but how does water matter to the economy? So in this work, we really began to put some a framework and a economic numbers behind the different ways water and water innovation can drive job creation and economic growth. And they include some of the legacy ways. I mean, this region and lots of the world benefited by water as a conduit. You transported goods, trade across the waters. I mean, this region in particular, it was opened up by the fur trade. And then, actually, when the Erie Canal was built and connected the Great Lakes to the East Coast, the population of Michigan exploded, multiplied eight times in the 1830s because people could come and farm here and make things here and ship them out. And the water was the conduit, so the water is a highway. We use the resources, fishing. We also use the resource in agriculture, in making things, in chemical making, steel making. So water, the use and abuse of water as a resource. And those are the big ways that water has always mattered. But the coming emerging ways, and I'm going to illustrate those, are the most exciting and the areas of the kind of sustainable water use of the future and enjoyment. One is just emerging products and services and businesses that are about solving water problems, new technologies, new water conservation, new water cleaning. The second is being the center of research and innovation and education on solving the world's water problems and educating the water workers from infrastructure to the scientists to the environmental engineers for the world that the world needs for the future, which we all can do and we can do it particularly here. And beautiful blue places where you clean up the water and reconnect to people to them. And you've seen that in Grand Rapids. As an example, this was an industrial community. The river was an afterthought. There were bumps and slag heaps and things along it. All that's changed. And now this water is like a main street through this community and a source of enjoyment and, and part of downtown revitalization. So, so we put numbers behind these things. The leg and you could do it anywhere. We did it for Michigan and the Great Lakes. Our fishing, shipping, Ports add up to 65,000 jobs in Michigan. These heavy water users, I mean, the, a lot of the industries and certainly the agriculture was here because you needed water to make paper, to make chemicals, to make steel, to make autos. So these big water users are still very significant. Many of them are now moving, and we have to help them move, but they're moving on their own to 
use water smarter, better, more efficiently, save money, bottom line, and have a better reputation. But 580,000 jobs are here in Michigan because of these big water users in manufacturing, in agriculture, in making beer, our craft beer, again. So that's a huge piece of water dependent industry. And we, we can, we'll talk about if you want, as we, in the long run, if we priced water accurately around the country and the world, so it factored in the cost of moving it around and taking care of externalities when people pollute it, if we really priced it, you know, Tucson and other places would be out of business. And we're one of the few places on the planet that can accommodate water use at scale if we use it, reuse it, because it can be reused if you take good care of it. But that's not the main future for us, big water users. I'm, I don't want us to market our region or any region because come and use lots of our water. The real money and new businesses are in these sustainable products and services that are about solving water problems. You know, here's just some from, again, from Michigan. It takes, to make semiconductors, you need super pure water. We have companies that make the super pure water. Uh, nearby here, Whirlpool, familiar name, they make kitchen appliances. They're moving to make the kitchen of the future and the hyper-efficient appliances that use zero water and zero water down the, you know, the, the, the drain for the future. So you're using hyper-efficient smart water use. These algal bioreactors, uh, there's other companies that are inventing new ways to clean water for medical waste, for manufacturing, without using chemicals, uh, with ozone. Again, very innovative. We see our, our wonderful Cascade um, Triple Quest biosand filter. Dow Chemical, huge chemical company, did a lot of damage to the water. They see their future, and the future today is global water efficiency in industrial processes in particular. So they make these filters that basically allow you to clean water and move water, cost of water movement, um, moving water when, in energy production is huge, and the energy used to move water in manufacturing and energy is huge. But the, their filters basically cut energy costs dramatically and allow everyone to use water much more efficiently as well. And that's their business. You put in green infrastructure, you know, the new infrastructure solutions uh, that are needed to take better care, manage water, all lots of innovations going on. So this, in Michigan, Today, we have 140,000 jobs in these emerging water technology product and service firms, including cleaning water, water engineering, ecosystem management, manufacturing new technologies like some of these. And very hard, most people don't really get their heads around this one, but being the center of education and research and learning and discovery is a huge economic engine. I mean, no new industries, whether it's IT or energy or um, medical, they all grow and thrive around centers of research and learning and universities in conjunction with private sector development. And so we've got in the region and around the country and the globe, your centers of research and education are a huge fulcrum as they turn to work on water issues. And these are just some of ours from Illinois is a leader, Wisconsin's a leader, McMaster's a leader. We're growing our, we have 10 water research and education centers in Michigan uh, and our community colleges are increasingly active in water. Um, programs um, and uh, credentialing for different water uh, occupations. So it's a huge engine for us. I just want to note, you know, a few years ago we looked at the Great Lakes region in particular, the Rust Belt. I mean, all of this is about how do we turn around the Rust Belt and be the, creating the economy of the future here versus the past. We looked hard at our region and the, the Chinese every year they benchmark like who's got the top 100 universities in the world with a heavy weight on science and engineering because we want to build some of those too. And 20 of the top 100 in the world are here in the Great Lakes Binational Region. That's more than any other place on the planet. Uh, it's more than the East Coast, it's more than the West Coast, uh, it's more than Europe. And these are the great public land grant and research universities, the Big Ten and sh that grew up here, a great innovation in America to create these wonderful institutions that are about educating everyone but serving business and commerce and industry. And just as an example, these, you know, these institutions really led the Green Revolution where we pioneered innovations at the time. How does the world feed itself? How do we develop the seeds and the fertilizer and the technologies to help people feed themselves? The factory, you know, farm model, we exported that. It fed a lot of people. India learned how to grow enough food for itself. Now India's got a new problem. They're out of water. And we all need to figure out how we lead the blue revolution. How do you grow food without causing damage to the water 
and help the world solve its water problems. And it's these institutions of research and learning that are the best in the world at that. And we can be the best in the world at following in the prob solving the problems in agriculture and in um, water related issues. So there, these research and learning centers working with business can help solve world water problems. And that's what we're turning and many are turning their attention to. And there's a lot of water problems. 780 million people not have access to clean water, lack of access to sanitation systems, people with waterborne diseases. And as we just see with the headlines, I mean, in California and everywhere, every home, every community, every building, uh, every manufacturing system, every agricultural enterprise has got to learn how to use water, a lot less of it, and treat it better and not wreck it and foul it. And that's a driver that's there and it's coming with climate change is acerbating it because all of a sudden, there's, whoa, there's water scarcity over here for two years and uh, we got to figure out what to do about that. And we're going to put new regulations on water use. So the places that can help everybody use water smarter and better, the firms, the businesses, the learning institutions, and the people, because uh, every part of our community has got to be transformed, are going to have a lot of work to do. So just by way of example, you know, Michigan, and I just mentioned India, need to figure out how to grow food without using and abusing and using much more efficiently water. You know, China is just turning to clean up the mess they made as they industrialized, which we have spent 30 years and 40 years cleaning up here from our industrialization. And they're spending a lot of money now to do that. And our firms, actually a lot of the firms like Limnotech and others that grew up cleaning up the Great Lakes are now helping clean up China. But you know, this is work for all. There's lots of this. Um, Toledo, you know, you heard about our algae, algae blooms in Lake Erie? The Toledo water supply was poisoned a few years ago. That's all, you know, that's like a lightning bolt when, you know, Americans can't get water out of their taps that's safe. And it's produced huge, you know, attention. What do we do to make sure we're figuring out the, the agricultural runoff that's causing that algae bloom? What do we do about that? What new technologies, what new regulations? So all of a sudden we're working on it. And, you know, Haiti and other places need drinkable water too. So there's lots of work to do. Uh, Detroit and Dakar and everywhere else needs wastewater solutions. This is from, you know, now we have a hundred year flood like every day. And this is one that just swamped Detroit because our infrastructure wasn't built to handle it. And that means we got junk running off into the lakes, our beautiful lakes. So wa new wastewater solutions, new wastewater technologies are being developed, need to be developed, need to be deployed, need to be paid for. And that's global work. And as I said, every farm and every factory, everybody needs to use water smarter, more efficiently, and treat it better. So all of that coming together does then the fifth way water matters, and the third of the emerging ways is it makes places that take good care of their water and where you can access it and enjoy it. So there's tremendous economic value in cleaning up the water. When we did the economic impact study under Brookings of the, the value of Great Lakes restoration. There'd been a plan to clean up the Great Lakes in the areas of concern and uh, put back wetlands to buffer uh, the lakes and uh, rebuild wastewater systems because we, you know, our lakes were in trouble and it, the plan was going nowhere because environmentalists and others cooked it up. But we did an economic impact study and said, this is about jobs and economic development enhance property values, new economic activity in communities along the waterfront if you restore and reconnect to it. And we put a very conservative, every dollar you put in the Great Lakes Restoration, you get three dollars of economic development, economic impact. This is about economic development and jobs in, guess what, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the swing states in the presidential election. So it was that economic argument that we got, we got smart. We made the candidates at the time, which was Obama and McCain, we're running for president, take a pledge. If you are elected, will you follow through on Great Lakes restoration, the $20 billion plan to clean up the Great Lakes? And of course, when they're running for president or running for office, they'll pledge to anything if they think it's you know, about jobs. But since it was about jobs in these states and the economy, as well as a nice thing to do for the environment, they took the pledge. Since Obama was elected, we've seen billions begin to flow with Great Lakes restoration. 
because it's an economic driver. You get the business community, you get the political leadership finally because it's about economic development because places where you can enjoy the water are more prosperous, vital, the market wants to be there, people want to be there. So you know, these are just some pictures of Detroit's riverfront and other riverfronts, Bay City and Grand Rapids here that have redeveloped their waterfronts and it's a huge economic development engine. So that's the fifth way. So as we put these systems together, sustainable water use, cleaning it, taking care of it, uh, and enjoying it, because people want to be near the water. It makes a beautiful playground for people choose to live and work in. With new things like water trails, you know, this is nearby here. This is happening all over now. You know, 20, 40, 50 years ago, the idea, like Muskegon, which is on this beautiful Lake Michigan coast, you'll see one of the most spectacular natural coastlines ever, I mean anywhere. Muskegon, their whole community didn't, didn't even look at the water. The downtown was built. They built a hotel with the windows facing so you couldn't see the water because it was just all these chemical plants and mess and, you know, it was, and it's one of the most beautiful natural areas on Lake Michigan that you could imagine. But now that they're cleaning it up and you can do things like kayak. I mean, there was an article, Detroit, kayaking capital. It's like, whoo, that's pretty cool. Who'd have thunk, you know? But it's true, it's happening. We're now making it possible for this lifestyle enjoyment and access to water to be part of our reality. And that drives further economic development activity. And you'll see that you know, they're putting the rapids back in the grand. It is not so you can get a little money from kayak rentals. It's because it makes Grand Rapids that much more of a hop in place for people to live, work, have an office, be an entrepreneur. Uh, it just makes it a cooler, more vibrant community. And green infrastructure and other pieces are a part of that. And you know, that brings us to places like Grand Rapids. Whoop. Where, you know, as you, you've seen, where all these puzzle pieces are coming together. Where you've had leadership, multi-sector leadership, from the business community, the philanthropic community, the political leadership has been tremendous here. So it is the greenest mid-sized city in the U.S. It's because it's doing you know, sustainable energy, transportation, and water uh, solutions. You're leveraging that physical water and waterfront and connectivity as part of your economy. You have institutions, businesses like Cascade and others, uh, research and learning institutions that are part of the fabric of water leadership, water problem solving, water education. And you know, Grand Rapids just recently set a goal of 2030. By 2030, it's going to be a sustainability leader. It's the business community leading that charge. And so that really shows when you put these puzzle pieces together, you know, you can mark yourselves, and I'm sure many of you are where you're from, as being this kind of place that is showing the way to be the sustainable future place and economy builder that is so powerful and so needed. So when you put it all together, blue really is the new green. And you know, I heard this, I heard this first, I went to the auto show in Detroit, which is our big auto show. And I hadn't really thought of blue as the new green until I went there. Though I'd, I'd thought about the fact that we kind of had our heads around the green economy, that there, was, there were jobs and new economic development opportunity uh, in the green economy, including you know, new clean energy technologies, making them, deploying them, wind, solar. Um, every, again, every building, every school, every uh, manufacturing facility needed to use energy smarter, install new systems, deploy new technologies, a lot of work to do, a lot of money to be spent there. Green places, green ways, parks, places to enjoy nature. There's a physical dimension to green. We're important contributors to economic activity and place making. And just the green values, I mean, green roofs and recycling and people buying local food and all of these are, it's a culture that people value. They'll pay more for green products. They'll, they want to participate in communities that are animating these values. So I, I thought of this blue as the new green. I hadn't put that together. I went to the auto show and the Germans have been on this for a while. They have a blue economy picture. It's sort of about the natural economy. It's a little different from just water. But um, for some reason Volkswagen had themed their, their show, their, their exhibit, blue is the new green. And it, it was everywhere, blue is the new green. I was like, I don't know what that has to do with autos. But I think what it means is that 
like green is now cool, but blue is like really cooler. I mean, blue is really cool, and it's going to be like blue is the new black. Blue is really cool. So the, for every it occurred, for every one of these dimensions of the green economy, there's an analog with the blue economy. There's new water technologies and products and services, uh, in cleaning, monitoring, conservation. As again, every system, every community, every building, every facility needs to be remade to use water better, smarter, more efficiently. Um, now we're building blue ways and trails along with the green ways as part of our physical reconnection to a place. And there's a blue lifestyle. People want to conserve. They want to save the planet. I mean, when, when my son and I a while back saw Al Gore's movie, you know, he went back, he was like 10 or 11 years old, and he, he did all the things Al Gore told him, including, you know, putting the, the, the bottles in the toilets to, you know, displace some more water. The, the paper things, like, fell off and clogged up the toilets. I had to get the toilets fixed. But it was a very noble, you know, it was a well-intentioned effort. Appreciate it, because people want to participate in this. So there's a blue culture and a green culture. So blue is the new green. And when we added up in Michigan, and we did it a bit for the Great Lakes wide, all those different ways from the traditional ways, shipping ports, big water users that are here, and the emerging ways, the exciting ways, the coming ways of the blue economy matters. Blue places, blue place making, uh, blue water technology products and services that are emerging. New research, education, activity, spillovers from that. They're going on in our universities. We found $60 billion, one in five Michigan jobs are connected to water and water innovation. I mean, that puts it as big as the auto industry and helping people understand, like, this is the part of our future, is to be the leaders in this set of work, just as we were leaders in this one we know very well. And again, cascade engineering and shifting some of those competencies from making auto parts to making water technology parts is a great illustration. We have the horsepower to deploy, and many places do. Many places don't, but we do. So it's a huge sweet spot for us. And Grand Valley State University, based here, and my Michigan Economic Center partnered on this this analysis of our economy. And you know, it's taking off. There's a great website. Go to that website. It's a beautiful interactive website with huge amounts of historical and current stories of the firms and the communities and the people that are innovating in this blue economy and what it means to them and also just the economic size, scope, and power of this for us and recommendations of how we advance it. How do we accelerate? How do we grow it? How do we support more communities? more of our businesses, how do we commercialize more of these technologies. But it's, it's a beautiful report too, it's very, it's beautiful pictures, I mean it's, it's interactive, check it out. Um, and this is a real sweet spot for us, the Great Lakes, and many other places on earth, uh, because we all need to be involved in this work. So if we can accelerate this type of efforts, you know, we, we benefit, we, we make this magical reconnection to our water, and particularly for us here, again, somewhat parochially, as the great industrial rust belt that built these industries, we wrecked a lot of our water and our waterfronts were an afterthought. Um, but we can reconnect and be a magical playground to live work and we can be the innovators in the sustainable water technologies and businesses and jobs of the future and we can reinvigorate our economies. And then, you know, as we do so, the rust belt becomes the, turns blue and becomes the freshwater coast as it should be because it's a beautiful place. Uh, and this is a big, this is a, a nice uh, transformational thought, but it's also a reality that we can animate here. Uh, and I was happy, the, last week, I got The Economist to write a story, basically, on this theme, which you can find um, for Rust Belt, Rust turning to the Blue Belt as their economic future, with illustrations from around the Great Lakes, including from Michigan, of how we can and are doing it. So this is a big part of our forward-looking economy that taking good care of the water and solving problems for the world with the horsepower we have is part of how we create jobs and a new economy here in our part of the world that you're, you're visiting if you're from far away. So where is the water in your economic future? I ask you to think about it and how water can contribute to what you're doing in your communities and your economy. And uh, again, you can learn more about this analysis at uh, that website. So thank you very, very much. It's an honor, really, to be with you and uh, applaud the great work that you, not only this mayor, but you all are doing, or you wouldn't be here. So thank you. Thank you.